All right, let's turn to lawyer and rise analyst Frank Tieter for analysis of uh, this. Thank you so much. Uh, good to see you on Newsnight tonight. So help us understand exactly what technicalities could have led uh, the appeal court, you know, uh, upturn the federal high court's uh, ruling on uh, Sil Silva's eligibility, in, uh, you know, to run. It's not uh, that easy to sweep it under the carpet of technicalities. We have laws and we have principles of laws, and laws are supposed to have a measure of certainty. And so in this case, um, whereas there are two major contending issues, there is an express provision of the Constitution and uh, decisions of uh, the Supreme Court earlier that actually bars any, bar any person that uh, has uh, taken an oath of office uh, for the position of governor twice, or you know, from being contested again. Uh, but it is particularly section 182. Uh, provides that uh, 182 subsection 3 provides that if you if, if an individual as I mean, the constitution has amended has actually taken a note of office and then it goes on ahead to take uh, for for example to complete the term of a governor that has died he cannot possibly have a third term he cannot possibly I mean he can only have a single term mm -hmm. so that was the major issue and I think Justice Okoro was sufficiently convinced that that's a position of the law and he declared it uh, as such. Unfortunately for him, he didn't address his mind to a fundamental issue in law, which is called local standard, that is the, the stance upon which, the platform upon which you can mm -hmm. sue. Uh, it's very fundamental in law. It's a jurisdictional issue. It's like the door with which you can enter the court. If you don't pass that door, whatever, whatever no matter how handsome or germane or, uh, or legal or uh, legitimate your, uh, your arguments are, your demands are, they yeah. will not hold water. So that is what this, uh, the, the Court of Appeal has said. By referring to uh, Section 29, Subsection 5 of the Electoral Act that says that only aspirants can actually challenge the eligibility of any person who has submitted himself for the primary of any uh, governorship, uh, uh, for the primary of the governorship election. Unfortunately, the the, the fellow that actually uh, initiated that case wasn't an aspirant. He was he declared himself as a, a member and an interested party. Uh, Is that uh, what you ever call in law a man or some interloper? interloper. Uh, yes, it's uh, actually a, a more pungent term will be a busybody and the law frowns at it a lot. So this Court of Appeal, I must say, gave a very watertight judgment uh, that would be very difficult to fault. However, mm -hmm. however, there's a big serious, there's a big issue. And uh, if I were in the, uh, if I were in the advantage position, I probably would ask them not to go on appeal because uh, Silva, if he ultimately wins the election, we will have the appropriate persons challenging his eligibility to be uh, elected as uh, governor if ever he wins. However, the, the constitution, I mean, the Supreme Court must now ask itself whether it will, you know, allow allow itself, I mean, allow a wrong to, to, to continue. But I must tell you, the Supreme Court will limit itself not to actually deal with the issue of uh, whether or not uh, Siva is entitled, uh, has had two, has had two oaths of, I mean, has been, had two oaths of office administered unto him. He, the Supreme Court may not. The Supreme Court may also limit itself to the issue of jurisdiction. In that case, right. uh, only after the election will anybody be able to uh, attack Silva if ever he wins. Mm. That's a long one because it will seem as if, uh, well, uh, the APC has to soldier on for it uh, to get to that point to see what uh, then happens. Oh, yes, and that you could tell from the kind of confidence that Silva exuded when he continued his campaign. Mm -hmm. Because and that's what we, we, we advocate for, that people should know the law to some extent mm -hmm. where they can be that confident and say, look, this is the position of the law, and I'm confident it will be up, overturned. But we see a lot of non-compliance to the simple provisions of the Electoral Act because politicians always immerse themselves in the process of the elections and fail to invest in lawyers. I expect that my colleagues at the local level, at all levels of the political process, should be seriously employed into by, politi by politicians to advise them. Well, how on earth would the express provision of Section 29, Subsection 5, be overlooked and a common fellow just comes and says, look, I'm suing the, the, the uh, challenging the, I mean, the candidature, I mean, the, the, uh, the aspiration of uh, Silva. When the Court of Appeal, even in the case of Elumilu, had said, 
forget that you cannot, as a busybody, as a meddlesome interloper, mm -hmm. just begin to inquire into the proper process of another political party. Only the aspirant who had invested in the process can actually make yeah. their challenges. So what are the implications of this? Uh, because it seems that, you know, yeah, politicians do understand that there's this, you know, loophole in the law that they can take advantage of. And they're dragging the judiciary you know, to actually do that dirty job for them. Yeah, because they, yeah. it, it, you see, my politicians do what we call much of political gambling. And I look forward to the Supreme Court issuing greater punishment for all of these frivolous cases when mm. they come up. But again, I, I don't know how to emphasize it enough. Why, for the sake of compliance, law, uh, lawyers shouldn't be, com I mean, lawyers should be always consulted at every level. And in fact, political parties, you have a large, every political party should have a large team of lawyers lawyers that actually vet every major uh, decision that includes the fielding of any uh, candidate at any level. And every aspirant or every court case should go through a sort of compliance process. In this case, we know that there are very many major forces that are against silver, but it's unfortunate that they are being flawed with such if a simple provision wins, of the law. If silver wins and is there for more than eight years, what does that mean? No, 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 no. You see, the problem is this, you know. Sometimes I, I believe that the law and our legal process should thrive in prevention of wrongs right. than trying to correct wrongs. Uh -huh. Now imagine, you know, the express provision of Section 182, Subsection 3, that says, if you have, I mean, that it doesn't actually expressly talk about when you take the oath of office and you are sacked because your election was invalid. Now, it talks about when you take the oath of office to complete the term of a governor or a president that died. Right. Now, that is not the fault of that particular person. Yet, the constitution limits your tenure to just a single tenure. If you take the oath of office and you served, even if it's only for three months. Now, imagine what the court will think about someone who took the oath of office because he was said to have stolen the election. The Supreme Court ought to have punished that kind of person mm -hmm. by not allowing the person to, to get near that office again. However, so, it is, the Supreme Court is faced with a conundrum, will be faced with a conundrum yeah. where it will now say, you don't have a locus to approach us. Nevertheless, you know, we, you, you, we won't look into uh, what the, the, the real issues are. Mm. I've always advocated that the powers of the Constitution given to the Supreme Court under Section 6 should enable it to rise above certain limitations of statute, express right. statute, and do justice. Because oftentimes, what is legal is not fair and just. Well, it's a fine place for us to leave it. Lawyer and Arise uh, news analyst, Fran Tietje. <laughs>